and get started, um, even if we're sort of short one presenter, because he should be here by the time um, his, his turn comes up. So we're not going to do any sort of introductions. We sort of agreed that your reading skills are excellent, and you should be able to read the bios and, and not need your time wasted by us um, doing any sort of introduction. I wanted to explain two things. We're going to be doing some multiple choice and true false questions at the outset, so that's what those giant cards are for. Think of them as low-tech clickers. And this note-taking guide, they compared three groups of students, one given the, the professor's lecture notes, one given um, nothing at all, and one given a note-taking scaffold. The students who were given a note-taking scaffold like this um, retain more, learn more, and um, uh, learned it better. So. Uh, that's why you have a note-taking guide for what I'm going to be talking about. Um, this is sort of an outline of what collectively we're doing today. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of um, introduction and talk about the andragogical implications. I'm using the word andragogical to refer to adult learners as opposed to pedagogical. Um, although sometimes with our students we may be right on the border there. Um, we'll use, I'll use that term. Um, then I'll talk about what I do in my second semester contracts class. Uh, Heim will talk about what he does um, in his practicum uh, program. And Jessica will talk about what she does in her first year skills course. And then we'll take your questions. So that's where we're headed. We'll start. Um, hopefully the slide will change and then we'll start. Yes, I thought I'd start by giving you a test. So that's why you have your low tech clickers to um, what are the reasons we might think about integrating um, transactional skills in a, um, in a first year curriculum? So I start with sort of an obvious one. And this piece of clip art is there just for me to remind me to tell you a story. So here's the story. Um, I had a student, I started doing a lot of transactional teaching in my contracts class about three years ago. And after the first year, um, the fall, one of my students came back to me and told me this story. He said, I went out to interview for a job, for a summer job, and the lawyer came into the room, dropped a contract on the table and said, tell me what's wrong with it. That was his job interview. And my, the, the student said, the first thing I said is, oh my god, that's, that's the student's first reaction. His second reaction is, he remembered that I had told him, because it comes up for first year students, that there's a lot of stress for first year students, and so breathing deeply is a good place to start when you're feeling panicky, so he did that. And then he started slowly flipping through and went to something that he knew. He went to the liquidated damages clause. Okay, I remember that. I remember drafting one in your class. I went to the liquidated damages clause, and it described itself as a penalty. And I said, okay, I could have something useful to say. That's a bad idea. And so he did. He went there. By then, he sort of had confidence because he knew something, went through the rest of the contract, identified other issues, got the job. Um, and that's one of the reasons. This is my freebie to you, my non-test um, example of why teaching transactional skills is because actually our students need these skills. They're valuable to them. They use them uh, perhaps even in their first summer job. All right, so I thought now it's time for, we'll start, we'll start easy, a true-false test. So take a moment, and when you're ready, you can hold up a card. Uh, it's, they're clipped together. You can hold up either true or false. It's on the same card. It's the last card, I think, in your staff. Um, and I'll give you 30 seconds. So we have only one, one not one. What do you mean minute. by what do you mean by learn more? Is my answer. Um, meaning that they learn more deeply and they retain it longer. Let's look at that. Okay. No, sir. And absolutely true. That the, the citation for it is Leah Christensen. Um, it's um, a series. I think it's the fifth study of legal reading. And in all five studies, what they found is that one characteristic of high-performing legal readers, meaning students who do well in law school, law professors, and judges, 
is that they read with problems in mind. And so if we don't give them the problems, they create them on their own. Um, but by and large, it's also, by the way, a little more authentic to practice. So working from practice problems, what are the drafting implications of this doctrine, actually increases the likelihood, perhaps, that our students will learn more deeply and retain what we have to teach them in terms of the doctrine itself, because it's meaningful to them. It's a very generational thing as well, that the research on millennial students is that the more they can see the actual authentic application of what they're learning, the more likely they are to um, use it and retain it. All right, here is a multiple choice question. Um, so I'll give, you, I'll give you 30 seconds on this one. And I'll tell you when to hold it up if you haven't hold, held it up by then. All right, please hold up your answers. We have a couple, we're, we're split between A's and B's. We have one C from the student. Actually, it's A. Uh, the citation is, I made it spin around for you so that you would get to see that. Um, Larry Krieger's research, it's a series now of studies, that he found that law students are the most miserable of all graduate students, even though when they come to graduate school, their levels of depression, anxiety, and substance abuse are about the same as other graduate students. His co-author, who didn't actually co-author this piece, but did all his studies with him, is a, an educational researcher who's out of um, University of Missouri, Columbia. Um, and his name is just on the edge of my brain. I can't make it come to the forefront. Um, but if you read uh, Larry's article uh, in the Washburn Law Journal, you know, he cites all his other stuff. Sometimes law professors do that. So, um, Anyone have a guess, why might teaching students transactional skills have the potential, this is more of a raise your hand and volunteer thing, have the potential to offset some of that issue? Yes, sir. The students get depressed because they get poor grades. They don't get, I mean, that's the, the whole reason they get depressed. They're all good students and they get lousy grades. Uh, and the argument here would be that you know, just as you tell them that great litigators, most of them got C's in law school, you know, it, it can ameliorate that because in reality, they may turn out to be good transactional lawyers anyway. Yeah, actually, if you look at Krieger's research, it's actually not only the grades that depress them. It's real, there's also a loss of autonomy, a loss of their sense of self. I can believe uh, that. That, that also can plays a role too. in that. Yes, sir? I was going to say it gives them something, it may give them something positive to do. Um, yeah, that generates more of a sense of accomplishment. It's related to Peter's point. Um, that's a good. One. We actually have a, a, our guest is here. Excellent. Uh, is it that because law schools have this current focus that very heavily on academia rather than on uh, practical application, students who are applying for their first internship go, "Oh God, I've been in law school here, but I have nothing that I can actually say because I've only learned." the academic side of things, whereas if they learn transactional skills, they can go into that first internship saying, I know what to do. I know stuff. It's useful. Um, another reason is that um, a lot of students, when they're in law school, this is the reason why they think this might help. No one knows yet. But the reason they, the theorists think this might help is because um, law school kind of sends the message that the only way to practice law is in a conflictual model. Right. And a transactional orientation might give you a sense that there can be practices of law where both parties win. And so you don't have to live your life by conflict if this makes you uncomfortable. There's just one other thing, though. The depression yes. doesn't come when you get grades. It comes way before you It's get way before. Grade. That's a great point, Brandon. So when you are giving them transactional things to do, that's one more thing on their plate, which, along with legal writing, uh, may overwhelm them. So I'll talk about that later on. Right. Uh, then it's all about how much transactional stuff you ask them to do. All right, here's another multiple choice question. This is from the Carnegie study. I'll give you a minute to look at that one. It's sort of an easy one. So the, the question hints the answer. It's not very yeah, obvious. Yes, and and sometimes I use multiple choice questions to transmit information, um, and that's actually what I'm doing here. 
that not only can it actually teach students the doctrine because it's more memorable to them, it has the potential to teach them a, a, a skill, something lawyers need to be do, to do, and even to think of their professional identity. I'll give you some examples from the way I teach contracts um, in which I try to integrate some professional identity um, mix through the vehicle of teaching transactional skills. All right. Okay, now, I want, I want someone to tell me the truth. Was someone not thinking about teaching transactional skills right before you saw this slide? Someone raised your hand. You were not thinking about this. So here's one last reason why teaching transactional skills might be valuable. This is the common model of how human beings learn. It's known as the cognitive model. Um, and generally speaking, um, the, the key thing I want to sort of emphasize is over there in the corner, selective attention. If we don't have their attention, they can't learn. This is why it's so, you know, and the research on multitasking is a big fat lie. There is no research to suggest that they're any better at multitasking than we were. They just go back and forth between tasks. Um, they're not actually able to think about two things at the same time at simultaneously. But anyway, one of them is Google and the other is Bridge. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, but one of the advantages of teaching transactional skills, it's different. Anytime we change teaching techniques, anytime that we um, do something the students haven't seen before, it's an opportunity to recapture their attention. And once we have their attention, we have a greater chance they'll learn and retain what it is we want them to learn and retain. All right. So let me turn now to specifically um, what I try to do in my second semester contracts class. Um, so I'm sort of trying to do um, six things. And so it, for, by, because I'm trying to do six things, it forces me to violate the rule of PowerPoint that you should only have four things. But I, I can't fit six things on a four-line thing, line, a four line thing, so I have to violate it. So um, I, I want them to get at least some sense of what it means to think like a deal lawyer. I want them to sort of get at least, so actually there's an excerpt, and you'll see that excerpt is tab A in the materials. Um, from, um, it's an excerpt from Tina's article. Yeah. Tab one. one, I'm sorry, tab one. It's called coffee. Uh, some of them don't have tabs anymore. So, um, it, uh, so I want them to get a sense of that. I want them to at least have heard of a bunch of contractors. They've actually seen, ah, I know what that kind of a clause is. I know, I, I've at least seen a mer uh, merger clause, a liquidated damages clause, a um, uh, force major clause, a lot of stuff that I almost already do pretty much in, in the basic contracts class. Um, I want them to be able to read a contract. Um, and one of the things that um, you'll see at tab three is some of the contracts that I use to teach students how to read a contract. The first one is actually a, a contract right out of my, my new case book. And I'm sorry, this will sound like I'm shilling the book, and I apologize for that part of it. Um, um, and what I do is I use that same contract, and then I use multiple choice questions based on provisions in that contract. And if you look at the merger clause, it's a problematic merger clause. If you look really closely, I deliberately made it problematic. It's a little squirrely in the language. Um, uh, the second contract that you'll see there um, I use because it gets students excited. It's the contract that people signed when they agreed to participate in that movie called Borat. Um, the, um, where they, what, what? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so, and so we, we use, it's a one page contract and basically they're, for about 1200 bucks they're waiving all their rights. Um, and it, it, it describes, it's a fun thing because it describes, the, for those of you who've seen the movie, it describes it as a documentary style movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so I, it just tickles me. It sort of gives them. The other thing that we look at is the famous M&M clause um, in the contract with Van Halen, where they said basically it's sort of an express condition that there aren't, uh, that there are any brown M&Ms in the bowl of M&Ms that the that the promoters required to provide, they get to walk off the, the set. Um, and there's a whole bunch of literature about why they did that. It's an interesting story. Um, fourth skill is the ability to uh, identify ambiguities. I, I'm not trying to have them experts at that skill. I want them to recognize that that's a crucial thing that, that the lawyers need, the ability to identify ambiguity. Um, I want them to draft not entire contracts, 
but individual contract clauses. So my, my aspirations are, they drafted my contract so about five contract clauses over the course of the semester. Um, and then I want them to engage in reflection about the process. Let me show you about, uh, quickly how I do that. Um, so this is actually, for those of you who are familiar with Farnsworth, this is right out of Farnsworth. This is the, the things that he says what makes for an ambiguity. It can be ambiguous because the words are ambiguous. It can be ambiguous because of a misplaced modifier. Um, uh, or it can be ambiguous because of conflicts between the terms. So one term says one thing, one term says the other. I thought you might find it fun to see the actual ambiguities. For those of you who know Farnsworth, you'll know uh, these ambiguities. Uh, take a look a moment and, at, at the first one. This is actually something I do as an exercise in my contracts class. I actually have my students pair, reach a conclusion, what is ambiguous and why is it ambiguous. Um, I'm glad to take a, a person to tell me what it is in case we make sure everyone sees what you see. Well, yeah, it's obvious. Uh, a radius of five city blocks suggests that you've got a ruler, first of all, that we know what, what a city block is. I mean, yes, it's it's totally I know what those numbers mean. And that you draw a circle, uh, and it's five city blocks, and yet if you go two and four, you're, not, you're going to be inside that five city block radius. Yes. Here's uh, a second. Here's a second one. This one's a really interesting one. I'll give you a moment to read it. Oh, all right. Well, I know these things. Yeah, yes. you're right. We all know far yes. I don't know how many uh, the rest of them. Right. Are that that's a beauty. That's a beauty. I love this one. Yeah, that's real nice. It's a real case, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, that one's gorgeous. Anyone want to take a shot at explaining it? You don't have to. I don't want you to feel pressure to do it. Go ahead. Well, in the, in the not common both sexes could be modifying disease or could be modifying organs. Exactly. So, it, 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 and it's sort of critical which one it modifies. Uh, and what what I do, and I'm, I, there's one more. This is this is a, just a really sloppily drafted one where they said they want to make it the fair market value, but they didn't, as reflected in a certain recording thing, and they didn't consider the fact that the recording thing wouldn't be current. So. Uh, a lovely conflict there as well. Yes, sir? That's, a, that's such a rotten case. <laughs> and that's from a real case, and just the result just stinks. Um, and, 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 and my point is, is that I think that it, uh, the ability to identify and explain what makes something ambiguous is itself a skill that our students need to learn. Yeah, well, what the court said was it was clear. The problem was that the language was clear. And what they didn't think of was the possibility that the county wouldn't keep up in its assessment. It'd be current, yes. Right. So, um, and, and so I'm not actually using it for the teaching of the case. I'm actually te using it for the teaching of the skill. And I do a technique that's um, group pair solo. So first they work in a five-person group to identify a set of about five ambiguities and explain them. Then they work in pairs to do it. And then by the end of that class session, and it's a whole class session on the skill of identifying ambiguity. Um, so this is the list of the drafting exercises that I have students do um, over the, the course of the semester. They fix that merger clause. They uh, have a client who tells them that they want the client wants a bulletproof liquidity damages clause. And the problem is in part that what the client wants is partially to address something that he has no numbers to give the lawyer. And so it creates a conflict between the client goal of a bulletproof clause and the ability to deliver the numbers. And so that gets, it, it's an entree into discussing the professional, um, the professional identity thing. How do you deal with that? How do you talk to a client about the conflict between the client goals? Um, this is, it's not actually truly a time of the essence clause, but it's a, a problem where timely performance is critical because they're going to hold the Super Bowl on a, in a facility that's the subject of a construction project. So they have to do something to make sure that the job is finished on time. Um, it may be worth your time to look at tab four, which is the, um, the last document in tab four, is a, a, pro a problem that I constructed working with a, um, it's called uh, Practice Problem 5, Tribal Coal Mining Contract. I constructed it with a, um, a tribal law expert um, who teaches at North Dakota. 
And the problem is, is that there's a tribe that has huge natural resources that it wants to exploit to bring money to the tribe, but has a conflict between its goal to preserve the land. And so the client's task is to draft, the student's task is to draft something that um, makes sure that the uh, oil company restores the land. My students came up with incredibly creative things. This was, on, this was on something they did, and I graded them on. Some of them came up with um, basically a series of express conditions where to get access to the next portion of the property, they had to um, meet a satisfaction clause of an engineer. Very creative. And this is the kind of thinking we want our students to think about. It's great if they can tell you what makes for an express condition, analyze something that's ambiguous that might be an express condition, whether it is. But if they can figure out how to draft around it, then they've really mastered it. Um, let me tell you one last story, and then I'll be just about done. Um, so here's the last story. Um, one of the people I consulted with in writing the contract book and in creating problems is uh, a guy who was the in-house counsel to a very, very large railroad. And he said, every law student can come and tell me about Hadley versus Baxendale. But what they can't do is tell me how to solve this problem, that they are shipping something for the railroad. It has a huge contract to ship something that's volatile. And they want the contract because it's worth boatloads of money. How do they deal with the risk? That's what, I mean, lawyers could say, yeah, if they disclose that this is volatile, that could you know, transfer the risk. But how do you, as a, a railroad company, take on the contract but distribute the risk in some way? Um, and he said, that's the kind of lawyer I want. Someone who knows Hadley but can understand how to draft around it. Um, I think, though, there's one last thing. Um, so if you look on page three of my note-taking guide, I'd like you to respond in writing to the question on the PowerPoint slide. It's uh, before you get to even the, the past. It's just that no. page three right there. So before you even get there, do the initial document. The cover document, the third page in. Hmm. I do this exercise every semester in the first semester of law school with my students. I have them self address an envelope where they'll be living when they graduate, and I mail it to them when they graduate. So they can think, be thinking about what kind of a lawyer they want to be. The building fund has been liquidated and will be distributed to you shortly. <laughs> 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 Is that a permissible answer? Sad, but permissible. <laughs> um, I'm going to stop here so that I don't usurp the time of my um, fellow speakers. I did actually bring a prize for, it's a Washburn coaster. Um, I was going to give it to whoever asked the most multiple choice questions correct, but um, instead I'm just going to give it to the person who responded to the most questions. Uh, so you will you know, I taught at Washburn the uh, year before you got there. Oh, fabulous. All right, so uh, oh, we're yes. on to our next speaker. The next slide will be well, I'm uh, Chaim Salmon, and uh, <clears throat> probably what I'm going to say is, is maybe a different cut at a lot of uh, what Michael just went through. Uh, and I call this uh, transactional lawyering a conceptual approach. And you know, we're all obviously here because we're talking about skills and skills training. And when we think about what skills lawyers <coughs> need versus what they're taught, you know, as is the premise of this conference. Uh, if you knew the law, the legal profession solely from the inside of the law school, you'd be amazed to know that many, if you know, a large percentage of them are corporate or transactional lawyers. When we talk about this in the first year, <clears throat> it's typically contracts and property that are the classes that I would say are screening for a uh, transactional perspective. I came here two years ago to the first iteration of this conference, and I listened and had some good ideas and I want to give credit. And I came back to my school and I said, you know, we should do something like this. And then after, you know, the usual horse trading and politicking on the faculty, of which the names change, but the, but the, uh, you know, the issues are the same in all your schools, 
um, you know, we decided that, that, that the small sections would be moved to either contracts or property, and whichever one you had, you would have a four credit class and a one credit practicum uh, to do some kind of transactional skills. Uh, we couldn't get any more uniformity of that, so everybody does whatever they want, as is the custom of the, the realm. Uh, but I'll tell you what I do. And uh, as I thought about it, I started with the course. And what, what I want to talk about is basically you know, three parts. A, the conceptual tension between the course is reflected in the case books and the idea of transactional skills. Uh, B, what I call you know, the, um, the, the contract drafting mode, uh, which I think goes a little too far in the other direction. And then my attempt at some sort of synthesis, which I termed the uh, conceptual uh, approach. You know, when I started uh, after law school, I went to work for Clear Gottlieb, and you know, worked in the M&A department, and that was the first time I had heard the words due diligence. I was in for a surprise. The next four years of my life were more or less dedicated to that, but I had never heard of it in law school, and I think that that is a problem. So the first thing I did here is I looked at the casebook I use, which is far as worth. And let me just preface that this is not scientific data in the sense that these are the cases I assigned from the book, and it's not all the cases in the book. But um, I, I assigned 95 cases from the text, these from others, and divided them into three categories. And then I further divided them between uh, the date of the decision of the case we read between pre-1980 and post-1980. And my categories were like this. Uh, lawyer contracts which are contracts, uh, the product of bilateral negotiations between lawyers for each party. Uh, One-sided or form contracts, where the contract uh, is either a form contract with key terms filled in, uh, and where the product negotiations where only one party is represented. And then what I call it informal or principles contracts, where contracts is formed by principles by way of either contract letters, conversations, words, actions, and lawyers are typically not involved. Now again, disclaimer, I, I, you know, I read obviously all the appellate opinions when, when there was an underlying opinion that was published, I read it, and sometimes I had a guess, okay? But all those disclaimers aside, this is not data, this is, we'll call it uh, anecdote with some attempt to, uh, to formalize it. And here's what I found basically, roughly a third, a third, a third. Um, in other words, a third of the contracts were you know, what I call lawyered, a third were informal uh, in slash principles, and a, uh, a third were the sort of one-sided or form contracts. But when I then kind of further um, divided, and I picked 1980 somewhat arbitrarily, but to try to get a sense of which ones reflect the contemporary transactional practice. And I sort of use 1980 as a somewhat arbitrary uh, date, but I think that you know to net out the cases that were possibly negotiated in a very different framework from the practice today. And when you do that, uh, you see, not surprisingly, that not many newer cases are of the kind of informal principles, right? These are the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the Hamer v. Sidways, the, uh, the Dickerson v. Dodds of the world. Um, you see what happens in the form, and then you see that the higher percentage is of the lawyer. But when you take that all together, roughly uh, just over 50, you know, about 15% uh, are the types of contracts which reflect the contemporary transactional setting. Now, why is this important? Because so often, you know, when you say, well, how do we make a case more transactional? You say, well, you know, what if we would have, how would we have fixed this, right? Every deal is a busted deal, so how would we have fixed it? Now, that conversation, I find, is only really useful when the, right, usually the problem is, right, nobody thought about anything, right? There was no negotiation. There was a form where the two guys were talking or, you know, in your class. So then to say, well, how would they have fixed it? So the students will come up with the legally correct answer. Well, they should have put it in a merger clause. Well, yeah, but nobody thought it through, right? The only time I find that that conversation is interesting and kind of useful is when you have a negotiated deal, and they say, well, why is this term here? Who wanted it? What was it doing? What do they think it would do? How did it wind up? And I find that relatively difficult, uh, given the body of cases that we have. Uh, in other words, you know, the world of Dickerson v. Dodd doesn't really exist. Uh, the world of Hilby Gateway and William Walker Thomas 
are not the types of um, contracts you hire a lawyer for. Now, as I was thinking about this, I realized that these cases aren't bad, they're just serving a different purpose. As I thought about it, what's going on in a lot of these uh, cases is that we're demarcating the outer bounds of contract law. In other words, how little consideration can you have before you won't enforce a contract? How poorly worded can a condition be before you won't enforce it? How totally messed up are the assumptions before we call it a mistake? Right? These are sort of asking the questions at the limits of the law. And our question is, enforceable, not enforceable, right? And that is, I think, what a work that a lot of these things uh, are doing. We, th we read them like litigators slash policymakers, which is, is, what are the boundaries and do they make sense? So we're constantly showing that contract law is a box, and the kind of standard doctrinal course is dedicated towards finding the limits of that box. Because we have fairly broad and aggressive freedom of contract views, the box tends to be big, and we don't really talk a whole lot about what happens inside the box. Right? What should you do with all this freedom? And that's the space that I, in my head, uh, demarcate as the transactional wiring, whereas most of the, ca most of the casebook is dedicated to these margins. I think that they serve uh, different purposes. Both are important. One tells us, I think, about the social phenomenon of this thing called contract, and how much stock should we put in it? And the other one tells us about business planning. But I think it's, it's worth thinking that they are uh, not the same. Now, as a response to this, you'll get what I call the contract drafting courses. And you know, I think Tina's book is sort of exemplary of this. Right? This is a book literally about contract drafting. Whatever its merits in the upper level, I think for the first year, this is not the approach that I would favor. <coughs> Uh, you know, here we emphasize precise drafting, we emphasize all the deal skills, but I think that it is too much for the first year for a bunch of reasons. A, you got to know something about bankruptcy, you got to know something about corporate law, you got to know something about uh, secure transactions. You know, any transaction is going to take us. And when I did some of this, I kept on getting this. Well, oh, you don't know about that. Oh, you don't know. Oh, that won't make sense to you until you do insurance law. So, like the whole thing sort of a little bit spun out of control. And the business terms. I mean, how many one else know what mezzanine finance? Is? How many of us know what mezzanine financing is? Uh, yeah, so the types of deals that, that you would spend a lot of time on require both legal and business concepts that are, I think, uh, the way above the head of many first years. And also, I think that skills are a little too specific. Certainly, a good deal lawyer has to know the difference between reasonable best efforts and best efforts. And all the kind of little magic words that appear throughout um, these documents. But I think that focusing a kind of first year experience on that, uh, you definitely lose the forest uh, for the trees. Um, so therefore, in kind of retooling it, I actually, don't, even in the practicum, don't spend a ton of time on specific language. So now I'll tell you what I do do. And basically, the transactional approach, um, sorry, uh, I, I see as having three goals, which are sort of listed in the outline in your um, in your handouts. One is a question I get all the time. What is the relationship between the legal doctrine and transactional lawyer? Right? They experience, I think, this huge gap that there's a contract law and then there's this drafting stuff. And how do they meet? And I kind of spent a lot of time trying to talk about that. Two, what value added do lawyers bring to a transaction? We talk about why do complicated transaction, what happens when you do. And third is what are the ethical and policy questions that we can, can we get at those questions that are traditionally part of the doctrinal course from the perspective of a transactional setting. So I'll talk for the rest of the time about two assignments that I do and sort of how I try to get them, how I try to weave these goals in. The first assignment basically its goal is very, is twofold. And this I would call under the heading of transactional issues file. Right, we, the typical course focuses on a kind of litigation-based uh, issue spotting, and I try to do some transactional issue spotting. So I give them a little hypo. It's basically there's a startup kind of zip car company that's buying a car from Hertz or somebody mm -hmm. like that. And I tell them that basically here's, here's, you know, everyone's a little bit nervous. They want to buy the car, but they want to make sure that it passes some inspection, that it's kind of, they're not buying a lemon. The other guys are willing to send it to an inspection, but want to make sure that they're bound. So the solution is to kind of create a very simple deal where they sign it, there's a 10-day diligence period, and then there's a closing. And then that, during that period, they take it to a mechanic. 
Then I give them a bill of sale, a form from a Dunlap from the Dunlap form that's just a transfer. I said when I ask them, the assignment is send me an email, I'm the partner, you're the associate, will this work for our transaction? Now the answer is no it won't, though they don't all get that. Um, but what I try to focus on is what is this what is this thing called a contract? And to distinguish that from the kind of sale, right, what Llewellyn talked about in his way, that yes, there will be a point where we transfer property at the end. That's not the contract. It's true that when you go to the cap and buy a soda, all those things are happening all at once. But the type of contracts you hire lawyers for, we sort of break them apart. Then we talk about why would you want to break it apart? And I have this like very, you know, this very kind of specific discussion with them. Why would you want to break these things apart? And then what issues have all right, so we've complicated the transaction. We're beginning to see why we might need a lawyer. And now I ask them, tell me what issues emerge now that we've broken these things. We've created a situation, and they're taking property in the same semester, where one guy owns it, right? Hurt still owns the car, but I am going to have to buy it in 15 days if something, you know, unless something happens. So we now sort of, something can happen. Now what? And I just kind of call them like in class. And we talk about, well, what happens if the car blows up in the meantime? Who pays for the mechanic? Um, uh, what happens if inspection fails? Can Hertz keep on renting out the car and piling miles on it? We kind of go through this. And this I call transactional issue spotting. That is, why do we complicate the transaction? Is it worth complicating the transaction? And then what happens when you do? What new legal issues arise? Then we go to why does the law matter? So on each one of these things, I ask them, well, what's the law? Can Hertz drive? Can Hertz keep on renting out the car during this period? And then they eventually come to, yeah, they own it. Okay, so now, you know, we, here's how we introduce the idea of default rules. So that's the law. Do we like the law? No, we don't like the law. Why don't we like the law? Because we don't want Hertz to rent it out and keep on piling all the miles. We want what are we going to do? And at this point, all I want from them is the idea that we need some sort of restriction. I don't get into how to draft it, how long, how short, you know, just the idea conceptually. What we want to introduce is a restriction. All right, who's going to come up with that? Well, a lawyer. I said, well, what kind of things would we want to do? And we just sort of, at this level, with you know, slightly more specific, um, talk about that. I'll ask another question. Um, McKenna comes back and says, car needs a $400 brake job. I said, well, what happens now? We did a pass inspection and a failed inspection. Mm, we don't know. So when we draft that inspection, uh, Provision. Do we want a detail? Yeah. So they all go through, and then, but you know, eventually we realize that we can make this contract 450 pages. We could try to spell out every single thing, and then we start asking, well, at what point is it not worth it? So I said, all right, here's another law question. What's the worst that can happen? And they say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, well, well you know, you're the buyer. What's the worst that can happen? And eventually we get to what well, the worst that can happen is you just spent fifteen thousand dollars, which is the price of the car, on nothing. I said, okay, so our exposure is $15,000. How much money should we spend on lawyers' fees trying to protect ourselves from a $15,000 loss? And we have a discussion about that. These, to me, are the kind of conceptual issue-spotting skills that I want them to get. My goals from this are basically the following. right? Whether, why and whether a lawyer should draft this deal, why and whether it makes sense to complicate the structure of this deal, and what are the costs and benefits? The stages, what is each stage doing? And what are the, then I ask them, what are the default rules for each term? Do we like them and do we want to draft around them? And what would drafting around them entail? And then how much money and time should we spend drafting around them? I think what law professors are good at is framing issues and trade-offs, right? Deal lawyers, people who do this for a living, are really good at, here's the, here's the airtight confidentiality provision. I don't have that expertise. I bring in a practitioner to kind of talk about some of that. But I think as, as a kind of teaching faculty, our expertise is framing issues and talking about trade-offs. And therefore, I try to run the practicum in, in that style to kind of get them to focus on these issues. The second assignment, yeah, I kind of do a bunch of these, but the second sort of type of assignment I do is what I call reading cases from a transactional perspective. So I teach this in the spring. And now I'm about halfway through the spring semester. 
So by now they've had three quarters of a year of reading cases in you know the kind of litigation uh, way. And uh, I said, and we do that in my class as well. But I said, now let's talk about what does it mean to read like a transaction lawyer. And the the the, uh, the sort of example I use for this is the letter of intent. So first, we just do the simple stuff. We read the classic letter of intent cases. We read TAA v. Tribune, which is not the book, but I had. We read uh, Call Data v. Cybercrime, and we read, you know, because we're in Pennsylvania, we read the Third Circuit Channel Home uh, versus Grossman. Right? These are the three. Um, letter of intent cases. And we do kind of the straight up thing. We try to get them, well, you know, what is the difference between the letter of intent and on the one hand sort of precatory negotiations and the actual underlying contract? Uh, you know, what is good faith and how is that defined? Uh, what is a breach and what are its consequences? Those are the issues that are sort of emergent from the cases. Then I give them a set of facts where, based on, you know, kind of, all right, they bought the first car, and now they want to get into a bigger transaction, where a letter of intent is a plausible uh, solution to the problem, right? They are not sure, but they don't have so much time, they need to get an answer. Um, and the first thing I ask, okay, well, we've just read all these cases about letter of intent, and we learned one thing. It's, these things are a mess. Nobody knows what to do with them. They don't fit into any established box. Why on earth would anybody draft a letter of intent? And we spend quite a bit of time using the facts I've given them to talk about whether a letter of intent is the right way to go. But then I ask them, all right, we're going to go with a letter of intent. Is it a good idea for this transaction? Let's assume the answer to that is yes. What issues came out of the cases? And then they kind of trot through them. I say, all right, what, how would that impact our, our, um, our deal? And here's where it's hard. I mean, this takes a while to get them to see how the re all those cases that couldn't figure out what good faith meant. So how do we solve that? And that's what I mean by reading like a transaction lawyer. Or nobody knew what the remedy was. You know, if, if it was fine to, yes, there was a line of intent, yes, you breached, nobody knows what the remedy is, right? The law is sort of all over the place. Is that a problem? Yes. Why? Because nobody knows. I was telling them, we want to make our case easy and boring. We want our deal to never be near any of the cases that you read. And then I kind of go through, all right, well, what did we learn? Well, what seemed to work in that case? Well, it seemed to work that they had, they tried to kind of talk about good faith in terms of exclusivity. Okay, is that good? Yeah. That, and then we, you know, we sort of work these things in, exclusivity, specific times, liquidated damages. And again, I'm not asking them to draft provisions specifically, but just to tie the stuff they're seeing in the cases to how does that work in to the way you might construct one of these things. So uh, again, right? So this is sort of what I'm looking for here. Why would anybody draft it? Um, you know, balancing a non-binding letter of intent versus a fully executed contract versus a letter of intent uh, versus a letter of intent. What does good faith mean, and what happens uh, when you breach? Now, when in grading these, I don't grade them for precise language. The assignment basically has to give them three categories. There's a confidentiality provision, which I explained to them the parties want binding no matter what. Then there's this kind of deal terms that they want binding in this letter of intent sort of way, as an agreement to agree. And then there's kind of stuff that they just want in there as a, as a memorial, but they don't want binding. And what I'm looking for is, can they figure out what those three things are? And can they basically put them in the right place and understand what language would go uh, with what? The other thing I look for is, did they at least conceptualize the problem that, that if they are in this zone of letter of intent, they create this question of what is good faith, and that that has to be dealt with? I don't care if their solution is particularly elegant, or certainly not if it's well drafted, but whether it's clear that they've grabbed the horns of the dilemma that they need to do something with this, and again with the remedy. Do they have some way of explaining what the remedy is, and how do you know whether this thing has been breached? If they made sort of head you know, head fakes in that direction, I give them you know, almost full credit. I give more credit if it's also an elegant solution. But if they show, if they, if, they, if they can demonstrate to me that they've understood the problem and traced it from the cases they've read through the facts of their deal into the document, then I'm happy. So I think the payoff, and, I, and then, you know, we sort of, that's more or less how the semester runs. We do a few more of these things. I found the payoff of this to be uh, substantial 
not only in the exercise we do, but as for the course as a whole. Michael spoke about interpretation, and a lot of the new research uh, that I find interesting on interpretation, and caveat, I'm also teaching legislation and statutory interpretation, so I'm fascinated by these issues, is you know, should the doctrines depend on the source of the ambiguity? In other words, this is the sort of thing that nobody thought about. Is it the sort of thing that they should have thought about? that they couldn't have thought about, or that they thought about, couldn't agree, and therefore included some fuzzy language that nobody knows what it means, i.e. We'll, we'll deal with it later. Having now put them in the deal construction mind frame, this makes a whole lot more sense to them. I used to try to explain this the other way, and it sort of felt they didn't know what I was talking about. But now, when they, they themselves have kind of lived with the, hmm, what word should we put here? And should we deliberately make it ambiguous and deal with it later? So when you're selecting the mechanic, who should select the mechanic? Some of them wanted to say select Bob's mechanic on Lancaster Road, and then we said a mechanic agreed to by the parties. I'll kind of view that as you see, these are two ways at it. Should interpretation questions be handled differently on the basis of why the ambiguity is there in the first place? Deal terms as price, right? Central to any law and economics analysis is the fact that conditions are another way of evaluating the deal. Again, I tried telling, teaching this to my students a million different ways, and only the smart ones got it. Until I started doing the practicum, in which they all immediately realized that, well, an extra condition will shift the price, because you're essentially changing. We're not just buying a car. We're buying a car with all these terms, and those terms influence prices and stuff. Everybody who's done this knows, but I find I've found very hard to teach until you put them in the role. Uh, slightly more uh, more abstractly, so much of the econ analysis depends on the ex ante ex post distinction. If you teach the course solely from the perspective of the ex post Dorkinian Herculean judge, that's the only perspective they have, and then again that ex ante perspective never hits. If you introduce a lot of the ex ante perspective, they begin to take to, I find, have a much more sophisticated take of those types of issues. And finally, also the ethics and policy issues. Uh, you know, my entree into the, you know, what Farnsworth calls the policing the bargain section is to then give them an exercise where only one side has a lawyer. And now, after uh, two-thirds of a semester, where they've seen how much value added the lawyer brings to the transaction, they are, I find them much more ready, and then have them draft well, when one side has a lawyer writes a fully one-sided contract and then just shoves it on the other side, they're much more ready and receptive to how to think about unconscionability, how to think about mistake, how to think about contra preferatory, how to think about all those doctrines, which are shrinking as we speak, but those doctrines that are at least theoretically there to protect uh, from these one-sided uh, deals. So that has been uh, my experience. <coughs> We're still tweaking for sure. Uh, and I'll just conclude with you. Know, when I came back, most of my colleagues were very surprised that I was like interested in this because I, on the faculty, am more of the kind of theory person and the last person in the world to be interested in uh, you know anything uh, that sounds too practical. But I found that this is not only a better way to teach the doctrine of contracts; it's also a very interesting way to teach the theory of contracts because they're they're engaging on it uh, from a number. Of perspective. So the goal, and this is very much a work in progress, is simply to you know, try to find that point or that range where the doctrine, theory, and, and practice converge. And I found that the practicum is helpful not only for the transactional skills uh, in the narrow sense, but for just a richer way to teach uh, the topic as a whole. Thank you. Hello, so I am Jessica Rubin, and I direct and teach the legal skills program at my law school. So I am one of the Meshuganas to which Tina referred earlier. And um, what I want to talk to you today about is why I'm not, or at least why I think I'm not. And I want to describe to you um, how I've incorporated transactional skills teaching into our first year curriculum. So um, we've talked already about sort of the, the motivators for bringing transactional teaching into law schools. And um, you know, here are the, the general reasons that we've already heard about. But for me, 
uh, a great motivator was the fact that I wanted to see them addressed in the first year. Because by doing that, uh, I felt like it would put transactional skills on the same level as all the other fundamental skills that are introduced in, during the first year. So they would become equally important to as research and writing in a litigation context. So for me, I was motivated by the lack of teaching that was going on, the market need for transactional skills training, and even more so, the need to have those kind of skills addressed and taught um, during the first year of law school. So uh, let me describe to you what we had in place at uh, my law school, which was a very traditional first semester legal research and writing class. So we crammed all of our research and writing teaching into the first semester. And in the second semester, we tried to teach our students what we call practical lawyering skills, interviewing, counseling, and negotiating. And traditionally, this was done by having the students rotate through simulated exercises, where we gave them fact patterns and said, pretend you're a lawyer or pretend you're a client and do this interview or negotiate this problem. And we were fortunate to have adjunct faculty who observed the simulations and gave feedback to the students. But the problem was that each week, the students encountered a different fact pattern, different area of law, and different partners. And I think their heads were spinning. I know that my head was spinning. So I felt like I wanted to sort of change the way things were done. So what I did in designing a new course was to add the important skill of contract drafting to that second semester course. So now they had to learn interviewing, counseling, negotiating and contract drafting. But what I did with all of the exercises and all the attempts to teach those skills was taken out of the litigation context, right? Because in the prior version of the course, one week they were dealing with a landlord-tenant dispute, the second week they were dealing with a, a labor dispute, and there was really no sense, uh, sensible pattern to it. So I added the skill of contract drafting and I pulled all of the simulations into a, the context of the transactional um, practice setting. I also hoped to give them a sense of a more sustained client experience. So rather than having different fact patterns and different fake clients for all the simulations, I had them stay with the same fake client for at least half of the semester. And my hope was that by doing that, they would have a more holistic view of being a lawyer, right? that you see a client really through many stages of its business life, and that they would also have the experience of engaging in deep thought and time to deliberate. Because so often in law school, I feel like we train our students to have quick answers in class and quick answers on, on exams. And I really wanted to cultivate in my students the ability to deliberate, sleep on things, and um, have that long-term experience with the client. So those were my goals in really creating a new course. So I, I want to describe the course that I created to you. And please interrupt me with questions as we go, if you'd like. Uh, we have large classes. And so I was faced with a class of about 44 students. Um, I had the privilege, had the privilege, of having four adjunct faculty members, practicing lawyers assigned to, to my section. And what I did was structure a class where I spent <coughs> the first six weeks of the semester giving them, before we turn to a specific transaction, I give them a basic introduction to each of the fundamental skills. So we spend a week talking about interviewing, a week on counseling, a week on negotiating, and a week on contract drafting, in somewhat of a vacuum. Right? I teach the skills, we talk about them, we demonstrate them in class, and then they practice them on business problems. Right? So for interviewing and counseling, I may have them um, interview and counsel a client regarding the sale of a business and the signing of a covenant not to compete. And by going through that isolated little problem, they try out their vocabulary, try out their skills for interviewing and counseling. To teach them negotiating and contract drafting, I have them work on an employment agreement. They negotiate against each other and then, then try drafting it. So again, small steps to hopefully cultivate um, some fundamental skills. So with that foundation of a few weeks and some basic skills behind them, I move them on to what I call the, the, the business deal. And we start the business transaction. And the way I structure it is I have students paired together for the remainder of the semester. So um, two students work against two students. And each team of two students has an adjunct faculty member. Right? And that adjunct faculty member stays with them through the duration of the transaction, the remainder of the semester. 
And that adjunct faculty member really serves two functions. The adjunct faculty member is a source of factual information for the students. Right? They interview that faculty member as if they're interviewing a client to gather information. And I supply the adjunct faculty members with weekly role instruction. So I'm feeding the facts to the students via their clients. But the second role that the adjuncts play is that they are observers and critiquers. So after each event, after each client meeting with the adjunct, the adjunct, after giving all the information that the students have asked for, the adjunct then steps out of role and gives them feedback on their performance. What they do well, what they do poorly, what information did they miss. So I feel very fortunate to have a, a wonderful staff of adjunct faculty members who come back year after year. And what I try and do in recruiting adjuncts is uh, draw them from different areas of practice so that they're not all corporate lawyers. Right? I have them from all areas of practice that touch on transactional work, but I have bankruptcy lawyers, I have environmental lawyers, I have intellectual property lawyers, so that my students get um, a variety of exposure. So the challenge in having a student go through a transaction during their first year of law school is that they know nothing about transactional substantive law. Right? And I feel like I need to teach skills through the lens of, tra of transactional law. So what I do, we meet twice a week, usually Tuesday and Thursday. What I do uh, in class every Tuesday is I deliver to them some substantive law. Right? So we start these substantive lectures by talking about what, what business entity are you going to create with, for your client. Then the following week on a Tuesday, we talk about how do you decide with your client what they want to do. Buy stock, sell stock, or buy assets and sell assets. Right? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Right? Then we talk about the issues the following week relating to selling and buying assets. Real estate issues, intellectual property issues, environmental issues. Right? So each week on a Tuesday, I deliver to them and we talk about substantive law. Then on Thursday, I let them loose. And what they do on Thursday is they go and they meet with their <coughs> adjunct slash client. And they interview and counsel that client about the law that we've talked about. After a few weeks, they've gotten enough bargaining authority from their clients that they start then meeting with their opposing group of lawyers and start negotiating. So that in the end, the group of four student lawyers produces one final contract an asset purchase and sale agreement. And what I've found is that as we talk about the substantive law in class, not only do I explain the law, but I do it in a very practical way for them. So I say, if you're representing a buyer, what kind of issues are you, what are you concerned about when you're buying intellectual property? Or if you're representing the seller, what are you concerned about when you're selling machinery? And I have found, much to my pleasure, that they're really able to articulate the concerns from their guts. You know, if I say, you're being asked to make a promise that the intellectual property you're selling is owned by you, what are you worried about? And if I tease it enough out of them, they're able to say, well, you know, I want to be sure that I really own it. I want to be sure that my employees have assigned it to me under their employment contract. So they're able to, even if they don't have the legal vocabulary, to say, here's how I want to put it in a contract, they're able to, at least in their guts, know I can't make that unless I do some homework. I can't make that promise or that representation. Right. Similarly, when we talk about buying machinery, right, if I say to them, you're representing the buyer, what are your concerns? They're gonna say, I wanna know that it works. I, know, I wanna know that you know, it's been maintained and you're gonna fix it if something goes wrong. So they know in their guts what the issues are and class is really designed to connect those gut feelings to contract terms. So that's what, what happens in class on Tuesdays. And then on Thursdays, as I said, they are able to go forth and meet with their clients and interview and counsel, and then go even further and uh, meet with each other to start negotiating and drafting. One problem, challenge, uh, that the class faces, in my opinion, is how to evaluate the student. <coughs> because none of them likes to be evaluated on their performance. Right? First time for a lot of them engaging in these lawyering skills and they don't like to be watched and graded. What I've done to sort of encourage participation and preparation but alleviate their concern about being graded first time through 
is that I give them sort of a, a soft scale for participation. And I'm, sh I'm very careful to explain to them that they're not being graded on the results. They're not being graded on how much money they got out of the other side, but instead on how they demonstrate their effort, their thoughtfulness, and their, their preparation. So I try hard not to attribute too much grading to, uh, to the stage of the exercise. What I do grade is the final product, the final contract that's produced by the group of four students. So you know, one problem, potential problem, is that students end up resenting the fact that they're getting graded on a four-person work product. Um, the other, what I've done uh, in the class is I've built in other uh, assignments on which the students are graded on an individual basis. So they don't feel like all of it is riding on the group project. So we have a few other pieces of writing along the way where the students submit a negotiation plan or a counseling outline. So they have some ability to either rise or fall based on their own merits. In addition, I've uh, some years used a final project that basically has a mini transaction and I've asked them to address uh, various aspects of it. You know, how, you, how would you negotiate it? How would you draft a contract to reflect the following settlement agreement? So there's a combination in my class of group, you know, grading on group work and grading on individual work. So it's been lots of fun to design it and put it together, but it's not a perfect model for doing what I'm trying to do, which is get first year students at least versed in transactional work. So you know, I'm left with, among other challenges, this list that I've generated and the fundamental question I have is whether it's too much for first year students, whether it's too much for a very short semester, we have a 13 week semester, uh, whether I am watering down important skills and important concepts for the sake of exposing it to the masses. And you know, over the years, some students complain about having to work on the same facts for half or more of a semester. You know, some students like it, some students get bored, some students get frustrated with a bad partner. Right? If they hate their, their partner early on, they're stuck with a partner for the long term. And some students get stuck with a bad client. They don't click with their adjunct. And to those concerns, I, I tell them that's kind of true of, of life. So I don't feel badly about those concerns. But you know, I, I wonder whether you know, it's too much and whether using adjuncts and relying on adjunct faculty to such a large extent runs the risk of the students you know, having unregulated feedback. You know, I give my adjuncts some guidelines, but at some point they're, they're free to give their feedback as they wish. So, um, for me, it, it's been a very, very great experience. It's been well received by the students. One, that's okay. Um, one really unique thing that we've talked about at the law school is um, whether students should be able to opt into this class. So in the second semester, the students all get the skills class. And I have just one section. Right? So my section is the, the business or the transactional section. We've moved to a system where the other sections each have a theme. So one of my colleagues teaches interviewing and counseling skills with a focus on public interest lawyer. And another one um, teaches the skills with an emphasis on the ethical issues in a lawyer-client relationship. And I think it would be nice if students could choose the theme of their section because um, I have found that in the years where they elect to be in my section, they've been much more receptive than you know, when they get stuck there by virtue of, of scheduling. So um, is it doable? I, I think so. Has it been worthwhile? I think very much so. Is it perfect? Not at all, but um, it's really, you know, a first step in getting transactional teaching and, and business skills on the same playing field as litigation skills. And I think it's really important you know, the title of, of you know, this weekend's uh, conference is What's Next? And my hope is that a full integration of transactional skills into a first year curriculum is what's next, or at least close to next. So um, at this point, I'm, I'm the last person be standing between you and the Bacardi Plaza. So uh, let me 
hand yeah. it back to you. I'm going to have you sit down. Um, and we are very open questions. This is what happens when you have people with a transactional focus collaborate on a presentation. They actually stick to their times, uh, which never happens on other panels. Um, and now for my grand theory on contract. <laughs> um, so we are glad to take your questions, uh, either all of us or if you want to direct them. Yes. Uh, this is uh, particularly uh, uh, for uh, Michael and Han. Do I pronounce that correctly? Um, uh, the, the, the conceptual approach versus the actual drafting approach, I think, is uh, the division I'm seeing between you. I have tried, Michael, actual drafting in the second semester of contracts, and I didn't find that worked out so well. And uh, you, any any thoughts you have on 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 how to how to set how to set that up so that it functions better, uh, I would appreciate. I, I tend to towards Times approach, which is to <coughs> is to sort of walk right up to the drafting and, and explore how the a, a, a provision, a merger clause, or a liquidated damages clause would work, why it's important, what the legal basis, what the legal context is, and then stop. Uh, so that's where I am now, but I, I would like to try drafting again, but I'd like to. So, so here are my two. I'm sorry, just right before you answer quickly, um, and when you ask your question, can you please state your name and the yes. school that you're from? Yes, my name is Howard Walthall from Cumberland Law School. Okay, and if you could repeat his name and, and school and uh, the question into the microphone for the recording and our transcriptionist, because it's going to be um, put on, transcribed, and put on the transcript. <laughs> Sorry. I'm still panicking. Yes. Okay, so that's Howard Waltham. He's at Cumberland Law School. Walthall, sorry. Um, Cumberland Law School, and his question was things that can can make the drafting model more workable. Is that a fair characterization? Right. In, in the basic contracts course. In a basic contracts course. So, a couple of things that I think, because I've been, I was really satisfied how it's worked the last couple of years. And one is very narrow drafting problems. Very, you know, they're drafting a, a single provision, not a contract. Right. Second is that that stakes matter. It has to matter towards their grade. So collectively, the drafting things count for five percent of their grade, and they know that the final exam will include one drafting experience as one of the questions in the final exam. Right. Third is um, you know one of the things that Jessica talked about is the quality of feedback. I sort of think the feedback is the most important piece in terms of producing a robust learning experience. And, and so what you comment on, and then how you debrief it. So I actually, this semester, and the students loved it, held an extra class session where we talked about, you know, use some examples from things they had written for the first two or three drafting experiences. They had five over the semester. And talked about what worked, what didn't work, why I was concerned about it. And a lot of the things that came up were the things that are sort of core drafting principles like needless use of legalese, misplaced modifiers that, that change the meaning, um, ambiguous word choices, all of those things that then became essentially a grading rubric for the future assignments and for when I graded their, their drafting experience on the final exam. And so by I think one of the reasons why the students I actually had a student come to my office and say, Schwartz, you gave me too high of a grade in contracts. This happened yesterday. Uh -huh. And I said, no. no. But, and I said, no, look at what you did on the drafting thing. He said, oh, no, drafting just comes easy to me. I love that was my favorite part of the whole final. No, no, that was a big part. I wasn't, it was not a huge part of the grade. There were other parts that were, much, but were bigger. But um, for him, it was sort of like he felt like he was somehow like getting away with something because drafting stuff, and, th and he came up with this brilliant pro solution to a particular problem that was on the final. So, um, um, the reason I partially believe in the drafting is because the students love it, and because it's an opportunity not to get them to where they get from Jessica's courses. I don't believe they're getting there, but to get them to feel capable of doing writing projects and to think about the kinds of considerations that were the product of that rubric. 
One follow-up, time, why not do it? Um, so, uh, I don't think there's as much space uh, between us. I do have a draft. I just, um, uh, well, a few things. Um, so I do have a draft. We do some reps and warranties, and we, we talk through it. It's just, in my focus, I tend to be more big picture, and you know, if they, if they don't do it the way that the, the forms or the manuals will, I won't get into that and why that would matter. So my example is, you know, in, in the best of your knowledge and your reasonable knowledge, you know, knowledge of the officers, of, you know, the sorts of things, the, the sorts of subtleties which are important, uh, but I think, I think are just too subtle for where they're at. If they can understand that, okay, there's a knowledge qualifier and why that might matter, uh, I'm happy. I also did have a drafting thing, you know, I, on my final, I had a, you know, something went wrong, and then I said, go back in time, you're advising them then, write the memo and write the language that implements the memo, sure. um, is what I had. One thing I will say is I have, tr I didn't do this this year, but I think what I do next year is give them a, a form contract for a deal that is wrong in 10 places. And instead of having them, because I think it's easier to mark up than to draft, uh, especially where they're at. So I, the way I'm thinking about it after this year is to give them the form contract or deal, it's wrong in 10 places, and then see if they can figure out what the 10 places are and give half the points for figuring out where they are and half the points for whether they solved it. Um, so that's somewhere in between, but I think that uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I want to experiment and see how that works next year. Um, it's not free-form writing, but it's it's much closer. And, and I think one of the things that he said actually really sparked something because on their final exam, they can they can explain their drafting choices so that they can sort of communicate. Here's what I was trying to achieve. Right. That gets weighed in, and I think that's something he's described him to, that he does as well. There is a question over here. Could you state your name, your law school, and your project? yeah, Peter Lindsay, University of Houston Law Center. Uh, it's, it's not a question; it's a comment. Uh, I mean, for the biggest problem that I see in this whole field is the, the fact that contracts clear, uh, classes have all been cut down to four credits, making it almost impossible to do this thing. I teach a four credit course, and I'm, I'm going to have night students next spring, and I'm trying to figure out how to do it. I do assign a drafting book. I use the Haggard book as a skin, because I can't justify you know, I'm spending a lot of money on a book that I'm going to use four days. And I can't spend more than three or four days on this, but I think increasingly I can look at every case and say to them, you know, how could they have avoided this problem? What could you do? I may be able to do something with that. I don't know. I'm going to try. I'm interested in the book you're coming up with. Uh, I think that to me, the reason for teaching it the first year course is to, to temper people, to acculturate them to this whole idea that we've all been talking about, the, that contracts is not litigation of busted deals, but is planning and encouraging a client and helping a client to achieve the client's aims. Uh, I think one of the things to think about in that, you know, is we draft, if we do drafting well, in a very precise manner, how does that fit in with relational contracts, which essentially are very loosey-goosey? And that's a tough problem. I don't have an answer to that. I'm a big relationalist. I'm also a big transactionist. And that's a hard thing to put together. The biggest problem, though, is I think everybody has to go and fight any, cha any change in reducing the first year course, because the more you move it down to four credits, the harder it is to do anything but bust it. That was uh, Peter Linzer of the University of Houston, and I'm not capable of repeating his great insights. Um, you, I don't think you did address my question about what happens when students get overwhelmed having to do drafting along with legal writing and procrastinate. How do you, I mean, they procrastinate their legal writing projects already. And how many credits is your course, and how do you grade these things? Um, I'll go ahead and answer. So the the during the semester things are all pass fail assignments, and they pet they pass if they if what they do reflects a good faith effort. Um, they are very short turnaround assignments, so that that you know it's like they get it on Tuesday and they it's due Thursday at the beginning of class. I, because and they're not drafting 
pages and pages. They're not drafting more than a single, um, you know, contract term or maybe two. Two. It might be two at the most. Mm -hmm. And um, and and so oh, really? I, I think part of it is also sequencing yes, with the legal writing and moving faculty as well. So. One of the things that we do at Washburn is we meet each semester to, to uh, coordinate our schedule so that we don't overlap. So I sequence the drafting experiences to coordinate with the, with the legal writing class. In, in my experience, um, the students are not taking legal writing at the same time as my course. Um, so we don't have that conflict. They absolutely procrastinate the writing they do for my course. I break out the grading. You know, I get to try and give them a template for each document, even the contracts. You know, I, there are basic concepts that I tell them I need to have in there. And I, I encourage them to address quality over quantity. So early on, I tell them, I don't care how many issues you address in your contract. What I want to see is that you've thoughtfully addressed whatever issues there are there. So I'd rather see them trace the stream of money through all the possible outcomes rather than you know, have a scattershot approach to many issues. So our, um, we have a kind of a four credit course with the one credit practicum, so that sets up the grading, so it's 20%, and I sort of just combine, so they get a combined grade, but it's 20%. Five credit grade. Yes, a five credit grade, right. Um, in terms of the procrastination, they do. Um, in terms of legal writing, they fetch, and we tell them that's what the world is like. Uh, in terms of the grading, um, it is difficult, which is why, you know, what I, what I think I'm going to do is, be, because some of them will use forms and not, and how do you balance that? So, you know, when, the, when it's clear they use a form, I look and like, did you understand what you wrote, or is there something ridiculous in there? And when there's something ridiculous in there, I tell them, I will take off more if it's clear that you just cut and paste than if you uh, do it. But what I think I'm going to move to is giving them the form that is, inaccurate or wrong, and then and then making it more like an exam where like, all right, here's what I'm looking for, and I can kind of tick off in a, in a more standardized way what they've gotten. But since they won't know what's wrong, they will probably read every word carefully, or at least theoretically. That was Brenda C. at Faulkner, and um, her question was about procrastination and student assignments and motivating students. Um, I actually really do believe, by the way, I just want to make sure I said this, that, that the students are way more motivated when they're doing this than when they're doing, they, they've already had a whole semester by the time they're doing this, uh, the, the case crunching experience, they get plenty of that, so doing something different, I've actually found them to be sort of excited about it. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I'm Mark Mahali and I'm from Vermont Law School. And, uh, I have, I guess, two questions. I am, how do you feel about this four plus one? I'm about to proceed four, and I want to integrate, I, I want to integrate transaction into it. Do you have frustration that it's separated that way? Do you think that's fine? And Jessica, I just have a quick question, which is, who assembles your group? Do you or do the students? The, um, I do. The group, you do, the group of two and two. You yeah. Do I picked them. Okay. So we're being recorded, so I probably shouldn't say this. The four plus one is how we sold it to the faculty. Uh, in other words, because we went through some the curricular change and everything became four, why is it? But I'm in charge of all five credits. Um, so it's true that we have a practice an hour, and sometimes it's early in the morning so that I can get a practitioner in there when I when I need them. Uh, but since I'm in charge of the whole thing, uh, I can distribute the time uh, more evenly. If doing it in four is hard, but I would again use what I call my those fifteen percent cases. There's there's not many, but there's a bunch of cases that lend themselves to it. And I think if you work with those cases and kind of you know bend them backwards and flip them around, I think you can get a lot of this uh, even in in the four credits. Um, although like everything, it's it's hard. That was uh, Mark Mahali of Vermont. He, want, he asked Jessica about um, how she forms her groups, whether it's student selected or professor selected. And uh, he asked um, I'm whether uh, how he feels about the four units plus one issue. Sort of doing this backwards. Other questions? It's Bacardi time. <laughs> Let's do it. Thank okay. you.